Happy Sabbath. Good afternoon, church. Uh, you are all welcome for this afternoon. It's still family life. So I would like you to stand. We pray. Let's pray. You can stand. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we come before you this afternoon. We thank you for the care you've given us from morning to this time, Lord. Mighty God, as we, our speaker is coming to speak to us, we ask you, Lord, we hear you speak unto us, Jehovah Lord. Mighty God, let your mercy be upon us this afternoon, for we pray in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. We once again invite our pastor, Pastor Mokoro, for uh, another presentation this afternoon. Welcome, Pastor. Happy service. I thought you've eaten lunch. Happy service. Happy day. Welcome once again to the presentation this afternoon. I meant to understand we have a Q&A session. Or if you have, you can make comments. I don't know how that will be done, but I believe there's a channel through which it is done. I believe so. I want to discuss a subject once again, very controversial. That theologians have also tried to address. It bothers me because for a long time, no one seems to be having a solution. But when I learned the concept of you only need to find out the plan of God as it was originally, then you'll find rest for your souls. We cannot survive with new parts that we would want to create for ourselves. When they asked me for a title for this afternoon, I supplied the title, The Spirit of Lamech Will Consume You. The Spirit of Lamech Will Consume You. I want to digress a bit before I get to what I want to discuss. But let us go to Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Genesis 2 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help me for him. Is one of those verses that I think so far I have about four sermons on. So rich and deep. But just from that statement, it is not good that man should be alone. It speaks to Adam's inadequacy, not Eve's insufficiency. Did you hear me? It speaks to Adam's inadequacy, not Eve's 
insufficiency. If we had time, we would have discussed the power of a woman. A being too powerful that God had to clothe her with a weak vessel for her to survive. She can disrupt you. She can build you. She can break you. The word in Hebrew is ezer. I will make him an ezer. That is one, one name in the Bible that a woman shares with God only. Elsewhere, some says that God is your shield and your help. The shield is what is translated as ezer. It's only used of a woman. So there's one quality that only a woman shares with God. If God ceases to be your shield, you're done. If it had not been for the Lord, tell me where would I be? That quality is only shared with a woman. If she moves, you are as good as done. And the Lord says, it is not good for a man to be alone. That inadequacy can only be filled by a woman. And when she's absent, you're back to square one. It makes me, therefore, in my own opinion, believe a man cannot survive alone, but a woman can survive alone. And that is the strength behind widowhood. Is a strength behind what? Widowhood. That a woman can be left with children, four of them, the oldest is only ten. And she can keep her husband's name 40 years later. No man is seeing her. She's surviving with God alone. But not for Kinamori is here. <laughs> Cannot. That man is incomplete without a woman by his side. And it is a need that can only be filled by a woman. Get me right. And so when God was filling that need, he goes into man and pulls out a rib which he uses to make the helper. I'm not here to discuss other things, but I'm just mentioning them as a by the way. Because if, if you go into someone and pull a part of him and make someone else, that someone else is just an extension of the other person. And so a woman is your second self. A woman is your doppelganger. Your wife is you. And when we say your wife is you, it means if you are the captain of this ship and things for some reason go wrong, I don't need to worry because the ship must continue. Mokoro 2 is still alive. So I have a problem when you jump ship thinking that your family cannot move forward because for one reason or the other, the captain has been disabled. Disablement is there. You like it or not. If it was not there, you would not have vowed for better or for gichai lungonang, for worse. You'd not. When you just wanted better, 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 better. There was worse, 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 worse. You should be ready for it. That's another sermon. But I'm saying, when you marry, she is yourself. White calls her your second self. That is ours. I move a lot. By the time I get here, one minute has gone. When she's brought in verse 23 to Adam, Adam says, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we are women because we came from where? 
from a man. And you must respect that idea, my sister. And stop living like you came from space. We came from the man. That's why we are called women. W-O is for well-organized well man. I believe so. And so in the Eden marriage, the incompleteness in man could only be supplied by a woman and not another man. God has never sanctioned gay marriages and he will never sanction gay marriages. Never. Because it was not like so from the beginning. I love how a certain preacher puts it. Miles Munro, Miles Munro says, the woman was created to receive. A woman was created to... Re she receives things. A man gives. A man has no opening for reception. This which you think is for reception is an exit point. So when I see young boys with rectal prolapse, anal infections, in the name of homosexuality, it hits me hard when I have to counsel with a couple where a woman is crying, my husband has a mistress, the mistress is a man. And these are church members. These are not people out. These are church members. In the beginning, the marriage I know in the Bible, that need can only be filled by a woman and not a man. In the house of God, marriage is heterosexual. there in the world it is homo but in this house it is hetero and so homosexuality is a concept of the world acceptable and very normal in the world but in the house of God it is a disgrace unacceptable abnormal when he created them Genesis 1 27 28 so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them and God blessed them and God said unto them be fruitful and do what? Ma do what? Multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Means after creation in man he put an inbuilt ability to multiply so he doesn't need to recreate. And that applies to all of God's creation. In in a seed is its ability to multiply. So God doesn't have to create another maize, another beans, another what? He put the ability in there for multiplication. So if we have to multiply and fill the earth, and I think 
those that were here and those that have listened to previous uh, presentations, earth is our multiplication space. And not just a multiplication space, a place for character development on transit to the home above. Because we are taking up the vacancies that were left by the fallen angels. And that is the sole purpose for which man was created, to occupy the vacancies that were left in heaven by the angels. So if that is the case, and you want to bring in homosexuality, it becomes a direct threat to the family unit. Because if we accepted homosexuality today, what we are saying, we will reach a point where we can no longer procreate. Humanity faces the threat of extinction. And that is what the devil wants. That is what the devil wants. Homosexuality demands that one individual convinces themselves that they are locked up in the wrong body. You must convince yourself. You're locked up in the wrong body. And so they have to live a lie that they are the opposite sex when their whole being speaks otherwise. So when I see a girl who is insisting on being a man and every month has to deal with monthly periods, the whole being speaks. Thing. You are a girl. You, you're not a boy. But, but the girl is saying, I'm locked up in the wrong body. I can assure you that that voice, the conviction that tells you you are locked up in the wrong body is the voice of Satan. And so the spirit that operates in you is demonic. And that is why when you're dealing with homosexuality, you can never, never, get me right, you will never succeed in dealing with homosexuality through counseling. It's a demonic spirit that requires deliverance. Not counseling. So what we are fighting is not a normal human being but a demonic power that is fought spiritually through prayer and fasting. Not arguments, not judgments, no confrontations. On your knees. It is God, the almighty, the self-existent God that designed marriage to be between a man and a woman. Homosexuality and other forms outside his divine design is an attempt to mock the wisdom of God. And none can succeed. And because again we have sowed the wind, we must reap the whirlwind. And we saw the wind when we refused to talk sex and sexuality to our children. We refused. We left it for the world to teach our children. Because it's a taboo subject. And the world is teaching it as it knows it. Yesterday we discussed about us living in Canaan but insisting on our children going to school in Babylon. And in Babylon, they will be taught how Babylonians know it. So your child will come home one day and say, Mommy, these are my girlfriends. They're gay. Then you're left to wonder, and you? Because if these are your girlfriends and they're gay, so what about you?
what I was interested in. The second bit is that marriage is monogamous. It is not only heterosexual, it is what? Monogamous. That's how I know it. Polygamy is sin in the eyes of a holy God. And there's no way to justify it. Africans are claiming that polygamy is, is cultural. The West is pointing a finger because for them, divorce thrives. For us in Africa, polygamy thrives. Because in the West, if I'm not comfortable, we just go separate ways, get another woman. And a preacher would comfortably come from the U.S., stand on this pulpit and say, I am pastor so and so. Uh, this is my sixth wife. The other five marriages didn't work. Comfortably. Either way, listen to what the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 81, paragraph 1 says. To the crime of murder, in which Cain had led the way. The crime of murder. Two. When you say to the crime, it means there's an addition. To the crime of murder in which Cain had led the way. Lamech, the fifth in descent, added polygamy. And boastfully defiant, he acknowledged God only to draw from the avenging Cain an assurance of his own safety. Question, is polygamy cultural or it is sin? Is polygamy cultural or it is sin? It is sin. Whether you want to cover it with culture, cover it with what? The Bible says it is sin. Introduced by who? Lamech, the fifth in descent. So even if you should have caught it with culture, God has never and will never sanction polygamy. It doesn't matter how you look at it. It remains to be seen. I call it adultery sanitized. In the law, I don't know other tribes. In the law, there is Mikai. Mikai is wife one. The Luo, wife two, three, four, five, are called Ochot. So I say, Macha Chotne. This is Mikai, and this is, I'm sorry, and, and, Yani, I can to me for example. Example Stacky. <laughs> so Mika is here, and what you want to call wife too, the law calls that wife his prostitute. And even in Ekegus, Ekegus, which also happens in our culture, the law. Have you seen women that have left their home and have gone to get married in another home? When they die, they're always brought back to their first home. Eke Gusi, they call that woman Ritinge. So, you're, in your mind, you think you're married, but in the mind of society, there's a place you had first done what? So, the law, what happens? If she dies there, 
the right to bury her is on the other side so it means the law is saying you're living in a bubble these things are not easy they are hard All throughout the Bible polygamy never brought joy and happiness in families. It was all chaotic from Abraham to Solomon. The patriarchs we mentioned their names and brag they were close to God but they had a thousand wives. I want you to listen to each one of them the way spirit of prophecy describes them. Abraham the book is Daughters of God page 27 paragraph 1 thinking it impossible that a child should be given her who Sarah in her old age Sarah suggested as a plan by which divine purpose might be fulfilled that one of her handmaidens should be taken by Abraham as a secondary sec- so he calls her secondary this is a primary wife and this in the law we have a saying that says mikai kiloki translate that hmm? mikai kiloki mikai cannot be changed <laughs> the place of mikai cannot be replaced So white calls her the secondary wife. Polygamy had become widespread. Remember it began with who? Lamech. Had become widespread that it had ceased to be regarded as a sin. The way we allow sin penetrate the church, we refuse to talk about it, we accept it, we normalize it. but it was no less a violation of the law of god despite the fact that it was it had ceased to be regarded as sin sop says it was a violation of the law of god and was fatal to the sacredness and the peace of the family relations abraham's marriage with hagar resulted in evil the next statement is painful not only to his own household but to future generations in one way or the other very few people lack a connection with a polygamous setup very few of us otherwise all of us have some attachment to polygamy flattered with her new position the wife to us come flattered with her new position as abraham's wife and hoping to be the mother of the great nation to descend from him Hagar became proud and we all know how the house of Abraham looked like until God had to tell Abraham even in this mistake i never change my mind when i've purpose to use you so allow this woman to do what to go i will take care of him of her and her son listen to your wife sir because the purpose for which i created you cannot be fulfilled in this setup else i will be sanctioning polygamy of jacob the book is from eternity past page 136 paragraph 2 the scene of jacob and the train of events to which it led revealed its bitter fruit in the character of his sons these sons developed serious faults
We were just discussing here with uh, the Nyarangis. And he was telling me he's the children's director in this church. And I was like, since when did churches begin to have male, female directors? Ma male children's directors. I know they are normally women. And the wife is trying to explain how they have come along and where they have reached, even with their own children. That there's a big difference when a man stands at the leadership level. There's just a difference. So when we say Abraham's, I mean Jacob's sons suffered a lot of faults, it was because you don't know whether today you should be a priest at Leah's house, which day you should be a priest at Rachel's house, which day you should be a priest at uh, house girl Warejo, and which day you should be a priest at house girl Wangawacha. Walea. Kids are wondering, this guy showed up the other day, where has he gone to? Again, they suffered serious SEs, adverse childhood experiences. And that is why they were so bitter in life. And then he went and loved one, one boy like this. Because he loved the mother. Friends, I tell you, it's hard to love two women cannot serve God and mammon. You will love one, hate the other. It's not possible. So when you think you're seated here and you have Mpango Wakando, seated in your life, Mpango Wakando, Nairobi South, you think that is far, we will not know. Siku yako inakuja, tunajua. Because the polygamy of today is Mpango or what? What kind? They suffered serious faults. They were raised bitter children. The results of polygamy were manifest, manifest in the household. This terrible evil tends to dry up the springs of love and its influence weakens the most sacred ties. The jealous of several mothers had embittered the family relation. The children had grown up contentious, impatient of control. The father's life was darkened with anxiety and grief because you want to consolidate, but it is not possible. In your heart, you're saying, all these are my children. All these are my wives. But I can tell you, it's not possible. And it is not possible because the wives are making it difficult. It is not possible because the Lord has never sanctioned it. Not because the women can't agree with each other. It is the Lord that has made it what? Possible. So because it has become impossible... Rachel today tells his son, Ukiingia ile nyumba, mutawekewa sumu. Lea stands on this side and says, Uyo mama yako mdogo alinitesa. Kama mindi alinitesa, sembuse wewe. Sembuse iskiswa hili. Sembuse wewe. The children of one man grew up bitter children. Bitter. So bitter. Many have used the case of David to sanction polygamy, saying that he had many wives, but God still called him a man after Noah. After his own heart is a wrong statement. Listen to what SOP says. It's a long read. The book is The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. I'm reading 
page 379, paragraph 1. They bring up to Christians the case of David, his sin in the case of Uriah and Bathsheba, his polygamy, and then assert that David is called a man after God's own heart, and that if the Bible record is correct, God justified David in his crimes. I was shown when there was a misapprehension. There was a debate in church over God calling David a man after his own heart and he has too many wives. The Lord seeks to resolve the debate. And Ellen White says, I was shown that it was when David was pure and walking in the counsel of God that God called him a man after his own heart. When David departed from God and stained his virtuous character by crimes, he was no longer a man after God's own heart. God did not in the least degree justify him in his sins, but sent Nathan, his prophet, with dreadful denunciations to David because he had transgressed the commandment of the Lord. God shows his displeasure at David's having a plurality of wives, by visiting him with judgments and permitting evils to rise up against him from his own house. That God permitted to come upon David, who for his integrity was once called a man after God's own heart, is evidence to after generations that God would not justify anyone in transgressing his commandments, but that he would surely punish the guilty However righteous and favored of God they might once have been while they followed the Lord in purity of heart. When the righteous turn from their righteousness to do evil, their past righteousness will not serve them. But we, I'm sorry. Are you listening to me? When the righteous turn from the righteousness to do evil, their past righteousness will not save them from the wrath of a just and holy God. That was David. So the Lord didn't approve polygamy. And for that little sin, if you want to call it little, David had to lose four children. Four. For that sin, he lost four children. He lost first the child they had had with Bathsheba. Then there's this boy who raped a stepsister. And then there was this boy who tried to overthrow him. And there's another one. And all that was predicted. He was told by Nathan that he was to lose four children for the sin he had committed. David's house was not a peaceful one. He had riches. He had a position. But he never knew the joy and peace that comes with marriage. And for the many women he had, his, his son Absalom slept with them. Broad daylight in the face of Israel. And because where the son has entered, a father cannot enter again. He locked them only to give them provisions never to be his wives again. But you'll hear some few boys seated. Dear, men are polygamous by nature. Which nature? Which nature? Last time I checked, you were created in the image and likeness of God. Which nature is this one? That makes you polygamous. That makes you date a girl at new life. And date another one at Lovington. Commit to this one in marriage. 
but chase the other ones for fun. Which nature is this? Which one? His last. I would call it so. Last. I am almost done. Solomon, his son, took after him. In fact, Solomon upgraded to a promax. I said, if my father had just this, I want to beat my father. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And I know there are women that were married by Solomon, not because they loved him. They were married because I'm getting married to the king. Bora Gina. Sijali vitu zingine. Afadhali ulie kwa Range Rover. Kuliko kucheka kwa bicycle. These things are not easy, we are discussing. They are not. They are not easy. The book, we have a book here called the General Conference Bulletin, chapter 7. Of Solomon. It says this. But Solomon looked to man instead of God. And he found his supposed strength to be weakness. He brought to Jerusalem the leaven of the evil influences which were perpetuated in polygamy and idolatry. And every man in Israel would look at the king and say, ah, this is a king anointed by God and has 1,000 wives. So we can also keep at least 5, 5, 4, 4, 10, 10. I mean 10 versus 1,000. ratio. When Solomon writes his books, he writes with a heavy heart. There are men and women that have died, influenced by Solomon, died in sin, never to see eternity. He laments it. And he writes with a heavy heart. He cannot forgive himself. He cannot. I know you'll ask me difficult questions. I have no answer. I'll take you back to how it was in the beginning because I have no symptomatic solutions. If you want rest for your soul, the beginning. I personally come from a home. My grandpa had two wives. To date, it has never worked as we speak. I was born when my father was long dead, my grandfather. My father was class seven when the father died. So you can be so sure I was, was born many years. Didn't even see my grandpa. But the wars, that rage in that home, the bitterness, the hatred to date. There is nothing good in polygamy. You ruin your life. Never to see the kingdom of heaven. Nothing good. Nothing good. I'm speaking to my young girls that have cleared university and are unable to find life in a simple way from scratch. 
and are bent on targeting someone's house. It is because society no longer regards polygamy as sin. But in the books of God, it is still sin. You would rather live and die single than entangle yourself in a polygamous setup with the excuse that men are few. The, the men in the world are fewer than women. Who told you? That statistics, who took it? When it was taken, I never heard about it even on TV that we have some samples in Kenya. I never heard about it. Let me see anyone here who was a sample in that statistic. And did they factor in that we had women that are elderly? Who are once married, they're now widows. Did they factor even widows to conclude that men are fewer than women? Chances are the excess of women are widows and the elderly. Even right now, I can check single men, so many single. Why can't you just date each other? What is happening? Every year, in, year out, I meet young people. Pastor, I am of age. Help me get someone. Pray for me, I get someone. You know, and I'm wondering, what is this nonsense that the ratio is... What is happening? When I was seated with these young girls that had come to brief me over the dinner tonight. I hope you have signed up huh? over the dinner tonight. And they were telling me areas to touch on. I said, I'm aware of all those things. We'll talk about them. So I asked them, why do you have these dinners? Say so one is to build relationships that would culminate in marriage. Which group is this? These are youths. So ages what to what? 23 to 30. Oh. Why do you have that? Why can't you just open up this thing? Because if you are a 30-year-old girl in that group, your husband, you'll never meet them in that dean. <laughs> and I asked them, why couldn't you open it up to association of Adventist young professionals, 35 plus, not married, established? Hey! Iko kitu kwa account. When they come, they meet 30, 36, they meet some 28 or that compatible. But because you're insisting on finding your pair within your same age group, so you meet some 26 year old boy meeting with a 26 year old girl. Say, we met in a, in a church function. It will not work. I told them next time you have this dinner, Make sure Adven association of Adventist youth professionals. You can forget about the women, but the men in that group, bring them here. <laughs> because this is where their wives are. And the men in the, men in the youth, their wives are still pathfinders there. The men are saying, I want kienyeji. And I'm asking, what is this kienyeji thing? <laughs> they don't see kienyeji in church. What they see are ladies with artificial nails that grab the ugali like this. And they're asking, when will this girl cook for me? When will this girl do laundry for me? They're asking. They want kienyeji. And I'm looking at a girl who's 26, 27. 
already employed has floating money. Her money works for her and wants to get married to a 26-year-old boy whose money has not started working for <laughs> And they want to do life together. I give them a year or half, say we are not compatible. What a woman needs is a man that can put her in her place. Not as a dictator. Unajipata tu? Yani unajipata? Ukikuwa church, unapiga kelele, unapiga kelele, ah, elda wezi tuletea yu ujinga. Ukirudi kuwa, you, you try, wezi, unanyamaza. It just comes naturally. Comes naturally. And that is the beauty of a man who can handle his wife. You seem to have good ideas, but you can't just speak them. You melt before your husband. But when I have a man that I am controlling and manipulating, turning like a chapati, ta, 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 ta. the relationship becomes boring. And that is why I'm saying their husbands are in AAYP. It's a waste of time. Same age group. That is what it means to be a man. That a man can talk and win. But if you want to win the discussion every other time, he begins to feel very, very small. Very small. Very small. Very, very small. So my girls and my boys, there are many men, many women, single, if not in new life, Get them in Nairobi Center, Nairobi South, Lovington, Ongwaro, Cho, Nilisikia ingine naitua Karen Community, Karen Gat, Ikishinda wewe, Kenya Coast Field is here, CRVC, GRVC, Central Nyanza Conference, Uko hiko watu wanatafuta tu, wanatafutana, Ndi ukuja utuambia, kuna watu wa kuoa sasa uende kuolewa na bwana ya mtu na umekaa kitako kama mwenyewe you are a refugee in the eyes of heaven a passing cloud because heaven recognizes only one covenant relationship in marriage one spiritual covenant relation only one the rest is a passing cloud. Don't flatter yourself. Ellen White says when she speaks of Hagar and Sarah, she says that, what is this word she uses? They do not share equal rights. You can't. So I believe, as I wind up, we must come to a point and say enough is enough. We cannot continue to perpetuate the evils of our fathers. Enough is enough. Let it end with this generation. Let us raise a godly generation that fears God. I made a mistake. I don't expect my daughter to make the same mistake. I made a mistake. I don't expect my son to make the same mistake. Yeah, this is what our life has got to offer. We messed it up at some point, but it doesn't warrant that I should raise children the same way. The Lord is so gracious. He knows how to clean up the mess. But I must partner with God to raise a godly people. And if we must raise godly people, we must go back to the beginning. What was God's intention? May the Lord bless us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Heavenly Father. Tough issues we discuss 
They are not tough because they are. They are tough because we complicated our lives. Otherwise, they are simple. You know our capabilities and capacities. You can never give us that which is too hard for us. But the devil has lied to us. In our mess, speak to your children. No one else can speak to us in our mess. It is you who knows where every broken piece lies. And how to bring the whole piece together in a beautiful thing. If we begin to pick the pieces ourselves, it will become messier. I pray you will incline our hearts to yourself. To be able to keep your commandments. To be able to keep your judgments. To be able to keep your statutes. As we seek to raise a godly generation, all we need is wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And you are the source of all that. Give it to us abundantly like you have promised. May your name forever be glorified. Broken homes, make them whole. Because you're a God who restores. Ears eaten by all manner of locusts, flying, swimming, eating, chewing locusts. Restore them. And catapult your children to where they ought to have been at this point in life. Where there's been betrayal, give us a heart to forgive. Hearts broken. Those that have trifled with people's hearts. May we once again feel loved and whole and complete in you, Jesus. As we begin new journeys, having traced our path to the beginning, hold our hands and walk with us. Therein, there is no death, but life abundant. May your name forever be glorified, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Any question? Any comment? Please, you can ask for a friend. <laughs> I know of a friend. We can ask for friends. Yes. Let me see by a show of hands. Those that have a comment, a question. Please don't ask me difficult things. I will collapse here. Let me just see. Let me see. Let me see. One. Questions and comments. One. Two. Three. Four. This shall be the last. Question number one is there. No, up there. Question number one is up there. Well, polygamy is a sin, but I want to find out for those who are already married, shall they walk away with the children that they have in those marriages? As young people, we have gone ministry to villages where those ladies are already, as the, you've said, Ochot, the others, okay? So what do they do? Do they walk away? Because that also challenges ministry when you preach in areas like those and the people can chase you away saying you're actually breaking away families. And speaking to a congregation right now in the city, what shall we do with those who are within the cities, even in our very own churches that have contracted polygamous unions? What does the spirit of prophecy say? Should they walk away? I knew those were the tough questions. On, you're putting me on spot so that you can say, the, the Adventist preacher. 
has advised. I do not set standards. Spiritual standards, none of us can set. They are set by who? By God. When God sets the standard here, no one has authority to lower it. When this is the path and you decide and try the absurdity of following this one, it comes with consequences. So we don't ask God to lower the standard for us to accommodate us. We must accept, agree with God, we have sinned. And that is the whole concept of confession. The word in Greek is homo logomen. Homo means same, one. I am agreeing with God. I am saying the same thing with God that indeed I have sinned. Forgive me. Forget about these confessions. You say, God, if we have talked a lot, see, see women, 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 women of ministry have met, and then they have started discussing another girl. I say, hey, God help her. Let us pray. Say, Heavenly Father, we have met, we have talked about Maureen. If there are things we have said that are bad, they know they have said bad things. <laughs> Forgive us. That is not confession. Confession is agreeing with God that we have been talking carelessly. We have talked about Maureen. We have, we have been backbiting this young girl. God, our conscience has convicted us. We are wrong. Gossip pass. Forgive our gossiping. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are saying even if you meet them in the village, the gospel has never changed. It remains to be seen. God should give us tact and wisdom on how to address it. But you're asking, there's this person that has stayed there for many years. I have no prescription, else I will be taking the place of God. The only thing I know, it is sin. So I'm not going to be presumptuous with God. It is your duty to go back to God. And ask him to direct your paths into ways everlasting. But I will not give a prescription. And neither am I saying that individuals in those setups are less Christians. No, that is not what I've said. I am saying we have walked into sin and we must admit we are in what? Sin. And if we insist on staying, we must be willing to take up responsibility. Number two. I see many hands coming up. Number two. And that is why I was intentional on counting because we will stay here forever. Number two. Number two is there. That is not number two. Check, check, yes. Yes. Check, check. Yes. Uh, mine, I just sort of want to piggyback right on hers, but um, there's this debate that's always happened in my mind. When I consider the beginning, um, Adam saw Eve, and uh, he, they were naked, and he called her bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And they became husband and wife. Basically, in God's eyes, when they consummated, they were married. Um, in our days, um, you find you were in a previous relationship. You broke up. It didn't work. Then you find a spouse later on. Now you get married. And you bear children. And I wondered... Um, in my observations, I've seen all blessings seem to go to the first marriage in God's eyes. You will find those children get blessed. But this, I don't want to say others, but this, this woman now who seems to have agreed with, or a man, 
this second, let me use the word, quote unquote, marriage, which now has peace, let's use peace for now, the blessings are not going, trickling down as per God's standards. And I've always wondered, where does God's grace come in? Is there grace for this second, quote unquote, marriage? Is there hope? Can you make a prayer of Jabez that he changes your name? I don't know if there's that opportunity or since the standard remains the same, then that's it. Your, for you, just accept. <laughs> I don't know what your thoughts are. We will not continue to sin because grace is sufficient. It's Paul talking about it. Must we sin because God, grace is sufficient? The Lord is so gracious when it comes to forgiveness. But it is one thing to forgive is another to bear consequences. So even as you rest seat proper in that arrangement, you can be sure the Lord has forgiven you. But you must be willing to bear the consequences. That is what all the patriarchs ripped. The Lord forgave them. They repented. But the violence that resulted out of those arrangements. They lived with them forever. They did. I like the way you began. In our days, <laughs> I'm saying in the beginning. And if you look carefully at what you're calling our days, is not an arrangement in the church of God. It's an arrangement of the world. It's not in the house of God. It's not. We are running marriages like the world is running it. But I'm repeating, the Lord is gracious. And merciful. You can be so sure that statement you have made, there's a young girl that has listened to it, but will still go ahead and do that which you're talking about. We'll still go ahead and do it. And people are comfortable. They will tell you, my first marriage didn't work. I began another one and I'm peaceful. That peace, I can assure you, is not peace. The peace there is a peace because the devil does not disturb. And he does not disturb because you're already in his camp. He's sure both of you are sealed for eternal doom. Why should he bother? That is what they call peace. Hmm. Number two. Hey, you're asking difficult questions, Yago. Hey. Okay, thank you. Uh, just give me one second. I add something to what you've just given to our young lady. Please do. I wanted to say this that she's still growing. There are some of the homes where we've seen uh, this polygamy is family. So what the encouragement I wanted to give you is that you've said actually at times you've been going for some of these missions, then you hear these people maybe saying that actually should we go back to our homes, they cannot go back to their homes. What I'm trying to say is this, Maybe it is a lesson to you, not to them. Because maybe they found themselves landing into such a situation when actually they, they, they did not know. But now you, who actually have learned from some of these polygamous homes, 
Actually, it should be a warning to you. I just wanted to add that, that it is a lesson to us who have not entered into that kind of life. Allow me to ask this. I wanted to say as a parent, uh, we have our children and, and, and we will just want them to have some good life, maybe in Christ. So my question is, should uh, me as a parent maybe participate in my son getting a good, a good somebody's daughter? Uh, Abraham did it and, and, and uh, to, to Isaac. So I'm, I'm trying to bring that question that can it still work today? How old are your children? <laughs> okay, my firstborn son is uh, 24. Okay. Yes. There is reason to worry. Friends, if you see the filth in homes, you would pray like I always pray to God, Christ come very soon. I always tell God, come before Natalie <laughs> gets married. Remember when I started these discussions, I said that the originator of marriage is God. Okay? I said it's not for the gods of other religions. The originator of marriage is who? God. And I said, marriage is not for non-Christians. It is not for non-believers. It is not for churchgoers. It is not for atheists. It is for true converts, which is a prerequisite to marriage. Because it's only when we have godly people coming together in a marriage can they raise godly children. And when I raise my godly children, I have no trouble walking into your home and saying, can we be cholera? I have no trouble. But today, you don't see it. I'm worried about my children when they will get married. And I've always said, I repeat it, I even said it here. If Christ ever tarries, I will literally hand pick spouses for my children. And I will do it prayerfully. Those are the moments I will fast like never before. They are the moments I will pray like never before. For God to just reveal to me, this guy that wants Natalie, this guy that I saw, Corey at New Life, that is so obsessed with my, my daughter. God, have you ratified it? Have you put your signature? Have you approved it? It begins there. So Ellen White says this. Before a man asks a girl for a relationship, before you even go say, Maureen, can we try out? The reporting place number one is at her parents' home. A parent's home. Even she doesn't know you have any thought about it. Go meet her parents. Tell the parents I am Morris. I was just thinking in this small mind of mine, if I can date your girl. You earn respect. And as a parent, once I know Morris wants to date my girl, I would want to ask for the opinion of my girl. If she is willing, I am saying I'm able to guide my children through their relationship. Forget about this thing, your child goes to the university. By the time they come home, they're already coming home with a husband or a wife. And when you begin to find out where is this girl coming from, he's actually a daughter to your sister.
and they will tell you yeah if that is the case if we are cousins we already have a child me i don't see a problem and they will run away they go stay together she advises young people seek the counsel of parents not parents godly parents takes us back to our teaching if we fail to raise godliness in people those are the problems we are now seeing here and godly people seeking to run a godly institution that that a commercial break i just continue okay it's okay I don't know what to do. Do I keep quiet? Do I? And to present some questions from the online. Um <laughs> Clifford Anthony is uh asking what is the position of remarriage in the Bible? Uh, there are three questions. I don't know whether you can take the first one, but I can read three of them at a go. The second question is um, from Naomi Mayaka, who asks, is it good for a man to inherit his late brother's wife? Um, Yeah, I think uh, you can take those two for now. Okay. Okay. Let me combine the first one with one here that is saying, can a person be remarried to another after divorce due to infidelity? Now, these are many questions in one statement. They are finding out what is biblical stand on divorce. And they're asking, am I allowed to remarry after divorce? I'm conscious that we have divorces here. I'm very conscious. And I don't mean to speak down to anyone. But I pray even as we continue with this discourse, it will produce a godly, godly sorrow in us that will lead us to repentance. Is divorce in the Bible in the first place is what we need to ask. And I know we've always clinged to Matthew chapter... 19. There's a Bible I use for my Bible study. If, if, can, am I allowed to pull it? Allowed to pull it? No, some people are so strict when they are streaming online. Yes, just, just pray. Matthew 19. That is where everyone le rests their argument. The person has asked infidelity. Is it? Yes. Allow me begin it from Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Fourteen. Yet you say, of course, is a conversation between God and Israel. Israel is trying to find out why God is not answering their prayers. Say, so yet you say, for what reason? Let me begin from 13. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you. <laughs> Did you hear it? The Lord is not answering the prayers of tears and mucus. 
and what? And he's giving a reason why he's not answering. Listen to the reason why he's not answering. Because the Lord has been witness. Witness tiendango. He doesn't need to be told the story. Janeno. He has nenod. He has seen it himself. He does not need a narration. The Lord has been witnessed between you and the wife of your what? Your youth, Mikai. Let me tell you, Mikai is so protected by heaven. that you cannot shortchange her. With whom you have dealt treacherously, you have violated your vow that you made. You know, is God speaking to the woman or God is speaking to the man? Speaking to the man. Yet she is your companion and your wife by what? Covenant. That's why I said, in heaven, there is only one spiritual covenant recognized when it comes to marriage. They are not two, three, four, one. Mikai. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? Why did God institute marriage? We have looked at that. He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Take heed to your spirit. And let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates a what? Divorce. And he will never love it. He will never approve it. He hates it. For it covers one's garment with violence. Of course, I recognize parties that have had to be served with divorce against their will. I recognize. And someone would be asking, for them, are they allowed to marry? That's a topic for another day. I'm answering the question of divorce. So we need to know the Lord hates it. And then someone jumps to chapter 19, Matthew, and says, Christ permitted us to divorce on grounds of what? Of what? Infidelity. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? They were testing him like you are testing me. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he whom have you not read? Yani ya ujasoma, unaishi wapi? Uko kwa hii kanisa yetu kweli, ama uko kwa lejo? Have you not read that he who made them at the what? At the what? At the beginning made the male and female and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so then they are no longer two but one flesh therefore what god has joined together let not man you know he has given them a preamble because he can read their hearts they are going to say moses <laughs> allowed us to do what he's already giving them an answer I know you want to tell me Moses, but I've said not even Moses can put asunder. They say to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of what? The hardness of your heart permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the what? The beginning. It was not so. That's why I keep telling you, if you want rest for your souls, ask for the beginnings. And I say to you, I'm the one now speaking. Christ is saying, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits what? Adultery. And whoever marries her, who is 
divorced ya gigi pack hii vitu ni ngumu wewe unaweza tumika kwa example hapana wacha tu nitumie imaginary people whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality commits adultery and this wife that has been divorced whoever marries us marries her does what so we are it's it's like Christ is saying if you marry a divorcee you are committing what adultery and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery his disciples said just like we are saying to him if such is the case of the man with his wife it is better not to do what nikugumu sio raisi people have at times misquoted that text and said except for infidelity like you're saying except for adultery the word in greek refers to all forms of unnatural ningumu <laughs> let me get uh, i'm not going to the book again all forms of sexual immorality all including pornography masturbation iyo yote then you sit and ask yourself if that is the case what is christ saying trying to say is he validating divorce then you realize let's just take one example one one holier than thou one example adultery he's speaking to a people he has already taught in chapter 9 if i'm not wrong chapter 9 or 5 he's already taught them whoever looks at a woman and lusts after her has committed what dalt let me ask a sincere question now that you are baptized and take the lord's supper maybe we have not been caught on the act of adultery but how many of us here can stand and say i have never entertained that thought in my mind yes i'm waiting sinena wangoja yani hata hata head dick on awezi kubwa so if it was christ speaking here today was a brood of adulterers if that be the grounds for divorce there would be no marriage today christ was not simplifying divorce he was making it harder and that is why i said when it begins to go down south tie a knot on that rope don't be quick don't be rash to make decisions if you understand my presentations on marriage is a spiritual battlefield understand the power that is fighting your marriage stop fighting your spouse fight the power that actuates your spouse you think the devil is happy when mokoro picks his phone and say pastor i miss you you think the devil says ha yeah wanapendana you think so it shakes him and he begins to think what is the next thing i will do so that they don't talk he loves it when we fight and if we cannot stand firm and lean on the everlasting arms for god to help us build strong marriages we will all go separate ways and that is why it requires a true convert 
to be able to run marriage is only a true convert that understands spiritual warfare. Only true converts. The rest, tabu kidogo tu chua. Hey, you are all over. On social media, single and satisfied. That was my past. I have opened a new page. I am moving forward. Deep down I know your heart is empty. Deep down. What was question number two? No, there was a question they asked here. Remarriage and... Um, Marrying you, it's called terror, is it? No. Terrorism. <laughs> the Bible says this. A woman is bound by law for as long as her husband lives. But when her husband dies... She's at liberty to be married to whoever she wishes in the Lord. She is mipango ya kando wapa inje. In the Lord. But I would advise, Paul is saying, she is happier when she is alone. And he says, he speaks because the spirit has led him. So this whoever is what I don't know whether the, your, your brother-in-law is inside. I have no idea. The Hebrews practiced it. Is it? But I believe it had a stop at some point. Because else it would be an incestuous marriage. I believe. So I hope someone is not asking me to approve them to go and marry their brother's wives. I mean, have you checked out here? It means you were hitting at her even before your brother died. <laughs> You've been having a thing. In fact, you could be a contributor in his death. How do you want to confuse your children that the man they call Anko today has become what? Daddy. It is because there are no women out here to marry. How do I want to convince my children? When do they call him Anko? When do they call him Daddy? Please, I have no authority to give you answers. I'm just trying to read from the biblical script. Of importance is that you will consult with God before you make any move. Learn to consult with God. There was a question there. It was one, huh? Don't get one. Okay. It was one question. Hi, thank you. So I do have two questions. The first one, in reference to the Bible stories, we hear, okay, we've seen that in the case of David and Solomon, they chose by themselves to be polygamous, to get a second and more wives. But in the case of Jacob, he was deceived into marrying the wrong wife that he did not intend to marry. So how was he to handle that situation? Was he to refuse the first wife? But you can just clarify on that. And a second question, asking for a friend. <laughs> it's true. Okay. If marriage was initiated by God himself, if, ma if marriage was initiated by God himself, if marriage was there in the perfect Eden, 
Is it really true that there will be no marriage in the new earth? And if so, why? Does it mean that marriage is a bad or terrible thing now that it is not permitted in the new earth? Thank you. The we are not talking about the new earth. Mwambie ajaribu. And that is a person who's so tired with the world. And he's saying if it is a must, let me wait for the new earth. Advise him to wait. We will find out when we get there. Personally, I have no idea. Umefanya hata tumesahau swali yako ya kwanza. Swali yake ya kwanza ilikuwa nini? Jacob. Ile story ya Jacob eh? ati alidanganywa. Na hiyo kudanganywa was a consequence of his sin. The master deceiver was also done what? Deceived. You know, if you look at your life well, chances are what you're going through is a, res a result of a long line of evil that rests in previous generations and continues to lift up its head in every generation me for jacob i think it was payback time just thinking it was that guy was a deceiver I tell you Jacob even didn't know his name. Never knew his name. When the father asked him who are you he said he's a sow. That guy never knew his name and the day he knew his name is the day God forgave him. The day he said I am Jacob and the Lord says you are no longer Jacob but the day he accepted that he was Jacob that is the day he received forgiveness otherwise even at labans he knows his esau because he's escaped with the birthright that does not belong to him he's a mind on the run hiding you don't go so far when you are wicked malipo ni hapa hapa aa si duniani nairobi Hiyo kitu haiendangi mbali. Haiendangi mbali. Hapa. Hapa Nairobi. <laughs> Tazen Gofa was reaping what he had sowed. I mean, how do you sleep with a woman? Wale wameolewa. <laughs> how do you sleep with a woman a whole night? And you have no idea. When he, she, he has never talked to Rachel working in that home for seven years he doesn't even know the voice of of Rachel when this thing they were doing when they were silent <laughs> I mean, how do you sleep with a woman a whole night only to wake up in the morning and find it was not the one you had paid out how me even me that thing i've never either he was intoxicated because it was a feast me I always say the intoxicated jacob so he just slept and was operating with an intoxicated mind when alcohol was gone <coughs> like my opinion even then even then because i can tell you the person that shot, shot, shot changed jacob was not a believer was an idol worship and believed in polygamy because polygamy is a, is a concept of the ungodly so to laban he was not doing anything but because his heart 
was in Rachel. I believe, like Helen White says, the widespread polygamy had been, they had already accepted and normalized it. I believe. If that was the time of Kina, Kina Abraham, what of Jacob? I believe they had also normalized it. And so he said, I sue. Let me work for the woman I love. And he worked. And the consequences of polygamy, God was not going to have him enjoy because he was deceived. He still reaped the consequences of polygamy. Still reaped them. So when God says it is wrong, it is wrong. Even if you toast it how it is wrong. And it comes with consequences. Be willing to bear. The final question. It was here. My name is Joram. Hi. Who's that? Is that a girl? Who's that? It's coming from her. No. Hello. God is good. I not all that. the time. Like for now, it's not good. <laughs> okay. You ask your question. So this, this uh, evangelist uh, at uh, Jivanji. At where? Jivanji. Jivanji hmm. Gardens. An evangelist. Yes. Okay. So he was trying to argue out that God is polygamous in this sense that uh, a wife in the Bible represents a church, then in Revelations, God sends letters to, seven, to his wives, the seven churches. So explain to me, Abu, what's your take on that? I have no take. That's Jivanji preaching. <laughs> I have no take on, on Jivanji preaching. And do you know that is how people carry doctrines into church? Because they had someone talk about it. Okay? God does not marry. Does not marry. Marriage is for, was created for, for man. Not for God. Yes, your question. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, my name is Lynette. Um, I come from a polygamous family. Um, my father has now come and be he wants to be rebaptized in the Adventist church, but he cannot even take Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. But my mother is allowed. He cannot even take a position in the church. Mm -hmm. What can be done? And I think for him, it's in a point where it's Holy Communion, he will just walk away, even if he wants to be in the service. Mm. I don't know. You know, in his old age, I think probably he would have loved to enjoy in the fellowship of the, you know, saints that he has now, but he cannot do because of his polygamous state. Thank you. Again, you're putting me on the spot. And I'll be so shy to answer it. Because the stand we have is ecclesiastical. It is the church's stand. For me to speak contrary, I would be at loggerhead with the church. Okay? And at times I say, we take some measures, probably because we have not gained a deep understanding. But the Lord will not let it go like that. We will come to a point. We must gain a deep understanding, and he will show us what to do. I guess the church looks at it like, if we began allowing polygamous men and their wives to lead in church, okay? partake of the Holy Communion, what we are saying is that we are sanctioning polygamy. And everyone will say, ah, but so and so is a third wife. He's a women's ministry's leader. So there's nothing wrong. 
I guess it's to cut back on the multiplication of, of that sin. But I understand what your father is going through. It is loneliness. Only God would know how to handle his case. Because we are not condemning anyone here. And we are not judging anyone here. For every mess we find ourselves, the righteous judge understands how he will close everyone's book. Yes, that is what I would, I would say. Naomba mungu awabariki. Musiwe tu watu wakusikiza neno. But you also be doers of the word. Of the word. If there's a path we know people have taken and they're ripping big time, pain and sorrow, let us not take that path. Enough is enough. It's time to raise a godly people. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' holy name. Uh -uh, which another one? Online. Muambia kuje. Uku. Um, Pastor Sam, you should be coming to pray for us uh, after it has gone. Huh? Okay. Um, I guess it? this would be the question that uh, um, I want to, uh, from Steve Hagire, who asks that if my daughter walks to my home with another Adventist that they want to get married, and the non-believer is not ready to convert. Can I go ahead and bless the marriage? My daughter comes with a non-believer. I first question my parenting. Where did I go wrong? Oh, yeah. You thought you raised a child in church. But you babysat a child in church. Can assure you our children are growing by grace. We are not raising our children. If they were raised like Moses, if they were raised like Daniel, if they were raised like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, have, they are not careful to consider unions with ungodly people, unbelievers. So it should shake you that they have brought someone else home. It should shake you thoroughly. And you begin to question your parenting. Myself, I will weep because I've gone through marriage. I know what it is. How would I see my child walk into fire? But you see, again, you're dealing with an adult who was also created with free will. I will make my point so firmly and express my opinion from the biblical stand. Her choice, she must be willing to take up responsibility because she is old enough to practice her faith. When I attend that wedding, I do not attend as Pastor Elizabeth. I attend as Natalie's mother. But with a lot of pain in my heart. But I have to respect her choice. Just the same way God respects our choices so much that he allows their results to stand until the day he will come back. They will not be your babies forever. They must take responsibility for the choice they make. But 
it troubles me. Is there something I did not do? If I did my bit well, I leave the case with God. If I am able to pray that it doesn't work, I will be glad. Until it doesn't work, and I'm good at that. Hmm? This is my niece. Just go on some fasting. I tell God, put a spirit of ill will between them. You don't need to fight it. If you know it is wrong, as a parent, ask God to put a spirit of ill will. Ata watashanga, sijana tulienda kwenu, nini mefanyika leo? I must be protective of my children. I'll do everything in my power so that when it goes down, no one will blame me. Everyone must take responsibility for their choices. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name.